name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Brethren in Christ, love day to Jesus Christus in secula. This is Timothy Flanders with the meaning of Catholic. Jesus is King. Happy to be joined by my friend Thomas Miris. Thomas, how you doing, brother? Good. How are you doing, Tim? Excellent. Very, very good. So Thomas is uh, from catholicculture.org. Links below. He runs the Catholic Culture podcast, and there's all sorts of great stuff at catholicculture.org. There are a ton of audio stuff, audio uh, fathers, audio books, uh, written content, lots of great stuff over at catholicculture.org. So make sure you check that out. Uh, anything new at uh, Catholic Culture, Thomas? Sure. Yeah. Well, as you mentioned, we have a lot of written content, but I run the little podcast network we have over there. So uh, on my interview show, the Catholic Culture Podcast, which is generally in the sort of arts and culture area of things. Today, I put out an interview with Maggie Gallagher, who was for many years the public face of the fight against gay marriage. But now she's the executive director of the Benedict the 16th Institute for Sacred Music and Divine Worship, founded by Archbishop Cordelione. Um, so she's now in the business of arts patronage and sort of communications for the archbishop. So uh, and she has a really interesting story. Um, and then uh, I co-host Criteria, the Catholic film podcast, where we, we discuss great works of cinema from a Catholic perspective. Most recently, we discussed the classic movie On the Waterfront. Uh, I don't know if you've seen that, but it has one of the great Hollywood priests uh, was made in 1954 has a very heroic priest character in it. It's based on a, a true story. Um, and then uh, we also have some podcasts dealing with sort of the, the, the Catholic classics. So way of the fathers with Mike Aquilina um, just finished its first season where he profiled each of the fathers of the church in 56 episodes. Um, and uh, now he's doing some sort of miscellaneous talks in early church history. So, uh, the role of deacons, the invention of hospitals, things like that. And then season two will cover the ecumenical councils in a few months. Oh, and then one. finally, we have Catholic culture audiobooks, which is what it sounds like. Um, we have a, a wonderful voice ac actor, James Majewski, who produces it all on a very professional level. And he covers um, a lot of classic Catholic writings, um, usually the fathers of the church or writings by St. John Henry Newman, but sometimes branching out from that into encyclicals and, and things like that. Uh, his most recent uh, episode was for the Feast of St. Thomas Aquinas. It was a sermon, one of his uh, St. Thomas's academic sermons. And most people don't even know that we have sermons by Aquinas, um, and it's on how to detect false prophets. And it's very, very good. Excellent. Yeah, one of the so much great content of our Catholic culture. Uh, I especially appreciate <laughs> your work thomas with doing just just the aesthetics of of a lot of great stuff that you have mm -hmm. over there so so today's topic we're gonna continue we had thomas on um last fall we talked about saint john paul ii's letter to artists right and uh tonight we're just gonna be talking about his christian personalism we're promoting the um english critical edition of voitiwa so this is volume one of I don't know how many volumes I don't know 10 12 volumes or something like that but um Jegash oh, more than Ignatic, that, I think yeah oh, okay yeah I don't know um Jegash Ignatic he was on the show for the feast of John Paul II last October he's the translator um and this is John Paul II's fundamental philosophical text person and act yeah um and so it's a, a very very important work uh to understand John Paul II to understand his uh, his um, vision of, of Vatican II and and its engagement with modernity, so we're going to discuss that uh, tonight. We'll see if this is part one or part two, part three. Um, we've we've just finished the first part of this text, which is just the the uh, introductory material. Uh, but I wanted to recommend um, a few other texts as well on this subject because uh, person and act is very difficult reading yeah it's very difficult philosophically um i'm glad we're having this conversation thomas because i i've had a hard time getting through it it's it's a difficult <laughs> text uh this is this one right here is the probably the best secondary source that i found 
um, the personalism of John Paul II by John F. Crosby. He's a Hildebrand scholar. Oh, great. And uh, this is just a great little 90 page breakdown. Mm. Uh, this is definitely the easiest text that I, I've found. It's like just a $10 book. Yeah, I should have um, read that first. <laughs> oh, well, it's really helped me. Yeah. Because this is literally the first like formal. Well, I guess I did read Love and Responsibility years ago and I didn't have too much trouble with it compared to this. But but uh, I really don't know very much about personalism. I should just say that, you know, uh, before when we talked about the letter to artists, I did have I had not expertise on that text. I'd read it a few times, but I had a lot to say contextually, you know, because I yeah. am, a, I am a musician and I have read a lot on the philosophy of art, of art and stuff. This situation is entirely different from that. In this situation, I essentially know nothing other than what I've read in this book. So I just want to be clear. Oh yeah. I mean, from the I, outset. Yeah. And I'm, I'm not an expert. I mean, <laughs> this is not, I'm not being interviewed here. This We're is a, a conversation. Just, yeah. <laughs> trying to help each other get through this material. Yes, absolutely. So we're hoping that this will just generate conversations in, uh, in your mind uh, with your, your own brethren and friends, um, because this yeah. is a, an important topic. Uh, the other text is um, Butiglioni, Carol Wojtyla. Yes. This I'd is uh, more there. difficult. It, it's, it is, it is a, a bit more dense, but it's probably easier than the actual text of Person and Act. Uh, but then person and act, it's, um, I mean, the whole text is mm, some 600 pages. Uh, but the first part is this, these introductory notes that Wojtyla has. So we haven't even gotten into the actual person and act. But I, I'm based on this reading that I've done. I'm going to try to define Christian personalism. I was talking with Jagash Ignatik about it. And uh, as far as I can tell, Christian personalism, as the teaching of St. John Paul II, uh, I would define as, uh, a guided by Christian revelation and Thomistic metaphysics, it is a wondering at the transcendent dignity of the human person. It is a reverent reflection on the image of God in man. Uh, and it's important to note this because the the English translation of this work first went through a, a very sort of strong paraphrasing that made it very phenomenological to the right. to the to the extent that all of his citations to St. Thomas were being deleted. Right. Uh, not all, but many of them, a lot of the Latin Latin terms that he uses are, are deleted. Um, so this text is a lot more faithful to the original Polish is that it keeps that St. Thomas, uh, all those citations of St. Thomas. So uh, John Paul II or Carol Wojtyla at this time, he keeps Thomistic metaphysics, realistic metaphysics. And then he uses, utilizes some phenomenological methods especially right. out of Max Shaler to investigate the, the reality of the subjective. And I'm, I'm using that phrase to try to uh, make clear that this is not a relativistic thing. Uh, it's Thomistic <clears throat> metaphysics. This is realism, but it's the reality of the subjective. And I I've actually talked to a very good Thomist about this um, to say that St. Thomas actually did not investigate the subjective as much. Uh, and so Carol Votiwa is invest taking Thomas and he's going into the subjective, which is this wondering of the transcendent dignity of the human person. Now, Tim, let me ask you, I, I have no background in modern philosophy. Um, and I am not as familiar with personalism more broadly as you are. We've read more Hildebrand and stuff like that. Um, is there any reason that personalism and phenomenology uh, would go together? Or is that just the case in Wojtyla more specifically that he's using these tools? In other words, is there any real like connection between the two or is it yeah. just, yes, I mean, yeah. So like, I mean, in terms of Hildebrand, I can only speak for Hildebrand. Hildebrand's phenomenology is essentially a, a, a platonic method of philosophizing which is just essentially using the subjective to intuit objective truths, such as justice, for example. You just have a, a subjective uh, knowledge of that that's just immediate. Uh, there's not a deductive reasoning when you see justice, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say that um, Kirill Wojtyla essentially, I think that the reason it's personalism as opposed to phenomenology is, as far as I could tell, because Hildebrand kind of just 
goes phenomenological everywhere. He just kind of goes on every, I mean, he's got ethics, aesthetics. He's got all sorts of polemical treatises. He's got treatises on um, sexual morality, on the liturgy. So he's going all over the place. But I think John Paul II, very, he really <laughs> focuses on the human person as sort of this, um, this center of philo philosophical inquiry that right. then sort of from the person, everything else follows, I guess. Um, but it, it would make I... sense that the person would be a fundamental focus if you're using a phenomenological method because you are discussing how things are experienced by us. Um, I think indirectly. I think okay. that you're kind of using the subjective experience to <clears throat> extrapolate out objective reality. But I don't, I don't think the focus is really even on the person. It's kind of like interesting it's um it's just sort of i mean like i'm reading hillebrand's ethics and he's just talking about the reality of values the reality of truth and justice and things that we experience subjectively but we know that they're real mm -hmm. um so he's very much um i think the person is is the the this greatest value uh in the natural world uh because it is the this person now um, one point, because I, I've heard some comment as to why is this phrase human person? What's up with that? Well, that's distinguishing the fact that there's three different types of persons. There is the divine persons of the Trinity. There's angelic persons. And then there's human persons. Yeah. And uh, all of these persons have a particular, they have rational consciousness, if you will, uh, especially humans. We can see that. Um and if there are aliens, I'm going to still say they're human persons. They still okay. fall into that category because okay, they're right. embodied intellects. There we go. <laughs> well, I wanted to mention this because there's this uh, there's actually this um, this prayer in the Latin mass, which has this sort of personalist character. And it goes like this is the prayer at the offertory, hmm. which says, oh, God, who in creating man didst exalt his nature very wonderfully and yet more wonderfully establish it anew. And then it speaks of the water and the wine. So this is when the pouring of the water and the wine is happening. And so there's sort of this, there's this, um, there's this Latin adverb, mirabiliter, uh, wonderfully, God wonderfully endowed man with this exalted nature. And so I think that that's, that kind of, that phrase really sums up to me, Christian personalism. It's really wondering at this human nature. Now, one thing that I thought of, Thomas, to try to distinguish Christian personalism is that it's reacting. This is what Carol <clears throat> Wojtyla in this letter to Henri de Lubac, he says that I have been focusing all my intention on the problem of man from a philosophical standpoint. And he very much sees sort of these two, as far as I can tell, these two kind of extremes in terms of man. So on the one hand, you have liberalism or secular democracy and whatnot which speaks a lot about uh, man's rights, but yeah. in to, to such an excessive degree that man's duties are diminished or eliminated. Whereas on the other hand, you have collectivism and uh, socialism, Marxism, which speaks of man's duties to the state, that, that the man himself is, is sort of subsumed and, and pulverized by the state uh, so that his rights are gone. And so I think in the middle, we kind of, we have this Christian personalism where, man has rights and duties uh, because he's a human person. He's defined by his relationship with his fellow man and with God. And so he has rights and he has duties together. And that's what I see as Christian personalism responding to both of these extremes mm -hmm. on either side. That's, that's at least how I understand it. Could we, um, could we say that, you know, beginning with the re Renaissance, there was this anthropocentric turn uh, turn towards man. And then at a certain point, um, you know, Christian personalism would show that, okay, if you're going to turn towards man, you're still going to find things there that relate to God. You're still, you're, 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 you're not going to be able to escape God by, by turning to man. So we're showing how at his very core man has to relate to God and has to relate to morality. Cause that's another thing that he points out at the beginning of this synopsis um, in this book is 
that this all relates very fundamentally to reality, not that the content of his reelection is about the content of the moral law, but that uh, that sort of the the relation to the moral norm is a fundamental part of what constitutes the relation between the person and the act or that the per the relate the relationship between the person and his yeah. act sort of immediately introduces the the problem of the moral norm um so you can't so so if you're going to look at sort of the subjective you know you're still not going to escape an objective moral norm and if you're turning towards man you're still going to have to deal with uh man in relation to god is, is that sort of something, I mean, big picture, big picture, because we haven't gotten to that in detail in this book yet, but is that sort of something that John Paul II is doing, broadly speaking? Yeah, that's that's as far as I can tell. It's the transcendence of the human person. Right. It's what really makes him a, a person uh, is this transcendence, which is is shown in many ways. We can simply say the image of God itself um, in man. Yeah. Uh, but like you're saying, there's there's this there's this intuition that's that's in the subjective of man, this intuition, this intuitive connection with the moral norm. So he's connected somehow with this absolute uh, logos of moral order, which he connects with in his in his his actions and his person, which, like you said, it was I was trying to find that quote from in here in the reading that we did. Um he says that, uh, oh, he, here he speaks of conscience here on page 34. Conscience constitutes a manifestation of the transcendence of the person in the act, for it brings into every act an element of truth in striving for the good. Uh, this is something that John Paul II brings up, I know, is the, the truth about the good, is that the intellect is, is attaining to the truth about the good yeah. so that the person can then act according to what is truly good and not just what he feels is good. And it's interesting that he says that that is immediately introduced by choice itself. The mere fact of choice involves choosing the truth. Uh, what was the phrase? Oh, the, the truth, truth about, about the good. good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, so, so yeah, you, you know, that's a bold claim that, that as soon as you're choosing one thing over another, there is a question of value. It's not a matter of indifference, a matter of mere sort of, uh, irrational nominalistic preference that there is immediately a question of value here. Yeah. And I think of the, on page 32, <clears throat> he says that self-determination is another basis for the transcendence because if, yeah, if you're a determinist or if you're materialist, there's no objective reality. There's no uh, man has no soul. Then he has no freedom. Freedom is this the sign that there is this transcendent peace that goes beyond the material world that is able to direct man. And what he what John Paul II investigates so much is the consciousness of that. You have this consciousness, this reality that you can actually think about yourself. You can reflect upon yourself and the fact that yourself is actually doing something freely yeah these are all manifestations of this transcendence in man that connects him with god and the supernatural well it's really interesting because you earlier you were mentioning emphasizing this is not you know a relativistic um project and i was fascinated by um how he finds like these layers of consciousness and like layers of objective within the subjective and subjective within the within the objective such that you know man's the objective reality of human experience is like only fully constituted when these two are integrated i mean we can probably get into the details of how he says that works but but uh but basically the idea that like your objective knowledge your speculative knowledge has to be integrated and become experiential um and then that that sort of full manifestation of <laughs> I'm struggling here because this is a difficult work that sort of, that sort of that full manifestation of experience what he calls lived experience like in a, as a single word um uh actually is not just a reflection of the objective but it actually 
gives uh, the human experience its objective fullness. Yeah, there's like an objective, there's an objectivity of the subjective. It's like, it's difficult going back and forth here. Um, he does have a little section on subjectivity and subjectivism. Yeah. Um, which is where he he's making this, and I mean, it's right in the very beginning, like he talks about how he wants to really have some kind of synthesis between St. Thomas and a phenomenological approach. And it's ultimately sort of an objective, an objective approach versus a subjective approach. Um, but when we say subjective, John Paul II is just saying, I'm looking at the inner workings of man's inside. Like when, right. when you're thinking inside your brain, that's still an objective reality. It doesn't mean not real. Yeah, it doesn't mean not real. It just means it's happening inside your consciousness. <clears throat> right. It's it's still real. Um, he says on page 89, so when he's talking about subjectivism, he says, once consciousness ceases to be understood as an aspect, thus in relation and correlation to the being that is concrete man, so if, if we if we abstract the consciousness away from an objective reality, uh, it also ceases to explain subjectivity. That is the subjectivity of man and his acts, and it itself becomes a subject. Uh, so, and then he says, under this assumption, with this mental attitude, both these lived experiences and their objective equivalents, that is values, cease to be something real. And so he's he's trying to get at how, if there if the subjective is so overemphasized in the idealism. Uh, you just close off in your own consciousness and your consciousness is the only thing that uh, or reality is just what you make it is. Yeah. There's he no says something there. similar about the emotionalization of consciousness. Um, <clears throat> he and says was... that the emotionalization of consciousness occurs when emotions and sensations exceed comprehension and they result in uh, collapse of self-knowledge. The emotions this can happen because the emotions are are too strong or the self-knowledge is too weak for uh or, or in, inefficient i think as he says for consciousness to maintain an objective component um <clears throat> excuse me i've got a little bit of a uh, uh uh losing my voice here today for some reason um the main uh the, but the main focus of consciousness then becomes not knowledge or or human acts, but what happens in me? Because early on, he makes this important distinction between what happens in man and what man is uh, consciously affecting in himself. Um, so, so with emotionalization comes this this sort of degradation from focus on acts, but on what happens in me. And if that gets bad enough you'll even just perceive it as something that happens. So you lose connection with the eye in which things are happening. So the emotions are mirrored, but without being mediated by understanding, he says they're sort of, they fall directly into consciousness. And along with this goes the emotionalization of lived experience so that, um, and I'm kind of curious if, to, to see how you understood this phrase, but he says that man uh, I'm not directly quoting, but he says man lives by ends up living by emotion objectively rather than fully, that is cognitively experiencing it subjectively. So he says that when you get into emotionalization or subjectivization, you are actually not only losing the objective, but you're actually losing the fullness of subjective experience as well, because part of subjective experience is objective self-knowledge yeah this is that uh what he says the mirroring what consciousness does is <clears throat> it takes your interior and it reflects it to you in a mirror so you can look at your consciousness or like your your interior acts through your consciousness you can see yourself see your interior you can kind of look at yourself wow i just did that i freely did this or i or like you said I lost control of my anger and did this. Um, <clears throat> this is similar to, I, I just read this in Hillebrand's ethics, how he, he talks about moral consciousness, where someone is really awake to the values, awake to truth and justice, 
and he is actively striving for it versus someone who is just moved about by the wind of emotion or the wind of subjectively satisfying things is the mm -hmm. phrase that Hildebrand uses. Um, I notice, uh, and, and to your point about lived experiences, um, on page 84, Foytiwa says, um, although emotions themselves happen in man, the same man is conscious of them and in a sense governs them through consciousness. This governance is very important for interior in integration. Uh, I think the integration is the, also the term that he uses in love and responsibility about mm -hmm. integ uh, integrating your whole person so that you have this sort of balance between everything. Um, yeah. And uh, I really like this part about the emotionalization <clears throat> because it made me think of a distinction that someone once I read somewhere um, where someone was distinguishing between feelings and emotion. He, he was saying that in like, if you're in a relationship, you, you share your feelings, but you don't share your emotions in this sense that feelings are basically your emotions plus rationality. Huh. You can look, you can look at your emotions and you can say, I feel angry because X, Y, Z. That's kind of like a rationalized, uh, a rationalized emotion, you know, that you can, you can rationally share with yourself, uh, with others if, if necessary versus, uh, if you just have emotions like raw emotions that take over you and you don't have that rationality involved, uh, you just act and, and you just act out of anger. And then maybe later you have a rational moment and you think, wow, I just got angry and I said something I should have said, or shouldn't have said or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that that's, to me, that like what, what Wojtyla said in, in high philosophical language, it really what seemed to be the, very similar to what I had read before. Mm -hmm. Because when you, when you rationally identify your emotions just by saying, hey, I'm angry because you did that, uh, you know, that's something that where you really take control of your emotions, you take control, you have a consciousness of it, just like he's saying, this integration, uh, governing yourself. Um, one yeah, one thing that, sorry, did you have something more you want no, to go say ahead. about that? One thing that he sort of repeats throughout is, um, and, and again, I'm not very familiar with idealist philosophy, but he keeps sort of contrasting his approach with theirs in that um, he is not um, absolutizing consciousness. So he says at the beginning that consciousness is a function, not a substance. It reveals the subject to itself, but the subject stands outside or at the foundation of consciousness. But conscious does not just mirror um, the subject to himself. It also it also uh, it also shapes human subjectivity, and because it couldn't because because precisely because we are. Uh, creatures with consciousness with intellect and will our consciousness shapes our intellect you know so so it actually shapes the subject to some extent um but but it is not the subject in itself so modern philosophy he says errors in substantializing consciousness so you you hear people talking your scientists talk about this all the time right like what's this the secret of con consciousness you know and and that's like um it's a pretty you're never going to understand the secret of consciousness if you treat it as though it is like the identical with intellect, for instance. The intellect is something that that exists at the foundation of consciousness. It is the, the consciousness is 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 what mirrors the intellect, but we don't experience uh, these spiritual, deeper spiritual parts of the soul directly. We experience them mirrored by uh, in in what of them can be mirrored by consciousness okay so you're saying that the um the scientist is trying to crack this uh consciousness reality um but that's because he's he's sort of positing that consciousness is like a human organ people talk that's about important. consciousness as though it is what distinguishes f us from other animals right and it's okay. like you have a higher or or certain animals have a higher like it's a matter of degrees right like higher or lower levels of consciousness um but they it's like they they equate consciousness with intelligence mm -hmm. 
Um, right. But consciousness is just something that mirrors and sh it shapes intelligence, but it is not in itself the subject. It's not in itself the intellect. It's not in itself the will. So they're treating the phenomena uh, – uh, uh, cause he talks about also the difference between phenomenalism and phenomenology. And he says the phenomenalists, if I'm using his term correctly, um, are the ones who absolutize it. So they take the surface and treat that as though that's the whole substance of the matter. Um, whereas a phenomenologist is using that consciousness, uh, to understand things that can't be directly seen like the intellect, like the will, like the person in itself, like the suppositum, the subject. Yeah, th this is another term that he uses, suppositum, which is a metaphysical subject of being and action. And when you add consciousness to it, it's, it's a person. So a suppositum is a person, a conscious person, or a, a, a person is a, a conscious suppositum, rather. Um, but that that's a good point that you're you're raising here because the consciousness um, related to the conscience really is what again goes back to that transcendent character that we can yeah. know transcendence we can know God we can know that there is a supernatural by using our conscious our, our consciousness um, we're not just brains we can we can think but we can also reflect on our thinking. Mm -hmm. by being conscious about what we are thinking. Yeah. And there's we're this conscious of our yeah. consciousness and we're conscious of, of not only our acts, but the fact that we are the efficient cause of those acts. You know, we we're conscious of the fact that we act freely, things like that. These are things that are all, these are experiences that are all present to us in consciousness. And these are the things that go beyond our material physical world yeah uh, and especially i think the reality of experiencing the fact that i am freely acting yeah i think that this is kind of this profundity that that he's getting just trying to get into with all these layers of consciousness um the profundity that i i act and i know that it is i who act and not something that happens to me yeah. This is this transcendent freedom. And this is why freedom is so important because it does manifest this transcendent character that goes beyond this materialism. Yeah. We haven't really talked about the act very much um, yet. Should we, should we talk about this? Yeah, the sure. Way he says that We're... the act is connected to the person now. Um, so just to explain the section that we read is the first part of this book. Um which which includes the work person and act and then it includes these pre uh the these pre person and act fragments related to the book and then also a third section with uh different talks and seminars and essays that he published on related topics after the book came out um so we read the first part which is like the free pre 1969 uh, fragments so it includes like a 30 page synopsis, which was really the hardest part because you're just jumping right in. It's super compact and dense because he's giving a synopsis of this whole project that he's going to go through in person and act. But then once you, once I got through that and started reading the fragments of sort of subtopics of the of the whole study um, in the next 60 pages or so. Um, those are less dense and he explains himself more thoroughly on those specific aspects um and so i started to see like what the significance of this project is and started sort of getting more excited about it and seeing the implications of it um but all that is to say that those fragments that he goes into more detail in um he's really focused on consciousness in a lot of those fragments so some of the stuff about the imminence of the person and the act and things like that uh I haven't read his, I won't get to where he fleshes that out until I read the actual study person and act. Um, and so some of that stuff is still less clear to me because I only sort of got the, the, the fullest treatment I've gotten of it is in his synopsis. Um, so that's sort of where we're coming from here. Yeah. We could um, talk more about some of his distinction there. I wanted to note one thing that I thought was helpful that I got from Botiglione is that he says that, 
uh, at least to a large degree, um, Wojtyla is commenting on the actus humanus, the human mm -hmm. act, what makes a human act as opposed to just simply an act, which is explained by St. Thomas in Summa Theologica uh, so Prima Secunda. So Prima Secunda, one, two, uh, question six. So if you go to that, St. Thomas talks all about human acts, and Wojtyla was kind of commenting on this. So I, I'm looking at my notes here, Thomas, from uh, from the first synopsis, and I, I, I had written down that there's kind of these three distinctions. Uh, one is the uh, sort of the actions of the person which are entirely outside of his consciousness, meaning like the, your organs functioning and whatnot. Yeah. That just automatically they act without. Right. Any... He distinguishes between action and act later on. Right. So then, then I have number two is feelings and things that happen to you that come into your consciousness. And then, uh, and then finally the acts of the will, which is where, he says on page 14, man experiences himself as the cause of action. Yeah. So he says that the first one would be with like what you were talking about is like the operations of our organs and stuff that we don't feel. He calls that not made conscious and not able to be made conscious. The second, which are like feelings that we are aware of or can be become aware of, he calls made conscious and able to be made conscious. And then the third one is conscious and more than made conscious, which I took to mean, I took more than made conscious to me like conscience, uh, sorry, conscious by necessity. Like these are in and of themselves conscious acts because later on he also talks about, and this, maybe this is relates to what he talks about later where he talks about like consciousness in the sense of a noun versus consciousness in the sense of an attribute and sort of the fact that our actions are conscious in themselves uh, our acts are conscious in themselves. And then there's the consciousness that we have of those acts. And those seem to be, I don't know if I'm getting this right or not, but those seem to be two distinct things. But so yeah, he's, he has conscious and more than made conscious, which means it's not just that I'm conscious of it after the fact. It's that this is, this act is inherently conscious. It can't be separated from consciousness. Yeah. I'm, I'm understanding it when he, when he's, kind of commented on St. Thomas, a conscious act, a human act is a conscious act because uh, your emotions happen to you right. and you are conscious of them. I'm, I'm feeling my emotions, but I'm not actually acting my emotions. I'm not, I am not the actor behind my emotions. I can use those emotions to then make a conscious act, but a human act, as I understand it, a human act is by nature, by definition, conscious, because if it's not conscious, it's not willful. It's it's not the voluntarium that he says. Right. Um, so he gets into motivation, a presentation of the good that brings the potency of volition to the act of vol volition. Um you know, motivation brings the element of choice. We were talking about this before. Choice indicates the moment of truth in acts of the will, the moment of choosing the true good over the false good, um, or I suppose that would be like circumstantial. So it could be that they're both goods, but one of them is the true good for that for that circumstance. Um, uh, and then so he goes on to say free will in the sense of auto-determination. This is my uh, my summary of what he says free will in the sense of auto determination does not presuppose only indetermination at the root of the will but also the moment of truth inherent in choice meaning that there is an inherent orientation towards the good in the basis of volition and then that's when he gets to how the uh, the two ways that the act is connected uh to the person um which i can say or if you want to oh go ahead, go ahead. Well. yeah so he has these two Latin phrases. Um, and, and you're right, you mentioned this Thomistic distinction. I remember being taught, I think, in uh, college or high school about like the distinction between human acts and acts of man, you know? So so he's already sort of made that distinction about what hap versus what happens in man versus, you know, what man is the conscious uh, effector of. 
So now he talks about how the act is connected to the person. So these two phrases, persona in actu and actus personae. The first persona in actu is the person in the act. The eminence of the person in the act as a concrete physical whole whose capabilities are integrated in the act. Basically, that means that the whole person is always manifested in a conscious act. Um, it doesn't mean that each aspect of the person is like is most directly connected to the act, but they all are sort of integrated um, in the act. One of the things that makes this difficult to talk about is that in the synopsis, these things are put so abstractly without giving like examples. So I yeah. mean, the stuff that you said about the workings of our organs and stuff i don't even know if he goes if he gets that explicit he might i don't think he says that i just wrote that in the margin I thought, yes oh, exactly <laughs> so i mean i think it's fairly clear that that's sort of what he means but he's really like you really have to be able to think in pure philosophical terms to read this synopsis because he's not sort of fleshing things out with examples or things like that um so i don't know you know uh, i don't know how to explain that well here, here's an example that i further when yeah. i think of like if if you are overcome by emotion and you act out of anger, as we mentioned before, like you say something out of anger uh, and then people will say people will calm down and then they'll say something like, I didn't mean what I said mm -hmm. or that wasn't me. And I think yeah. that they're kind of making reference to the fact that what was talking about, like that wasn't really a conscious act. It was just sort of. I was overcome by emotion and just sort of let the emotion take control. Right. And it wasn't really my person. It wasn't really my person that was consciously acting in those cases. Hmm. Uh, even though you're still, I mean, you're still culpable for your own uh, over, you know, being overcome by emotion, of course, but it's yeah. kind of like you do have this consciousness that something wasn't something that I just did was not really me. And that's right. kind of an interesting experience. I mean, we've all kind of experienced something like that here or there. Um, so that would of, seem to, I mean, because that person is still acting in a sense, you know, th that seems to raise the idea that like, and this is a very sort of, I guess, Aristotelian Thomistic idea, um, is that like, whatever you can define a thing as the, the good version of that thing is just that in the maximum degree. So we could probably say like, uh, a conscious act, you know, acts are all conscious, but, but the, the, uh, the good act, the virtuous act is the one in which, uh, the person is most fully integrated, that there isn't this disconnect where like one aspect of the person is sort of inordinately taking over. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah. It seems like that's, that's kind of his like this his is term, this is a metaphysical truth about how action always is but it's also something that we can try to make most fully realized yeah i, I that's what i understand um this integration this really because this is like getting into later on like when love responsibility when he talks about self donation the donation of a person and this is also what hildebrand says uh, donating your person, you can only do that when you are really integrated in yourself and you have this sort of balance of your, your whole, uh, person and all that you are, then you can give that over to someone else in the spousal relationship or in other relationships. Um, that, yes, that's how I understand. Um, shout out to, um, Joe Boca. He's in the chat. He's, uh, from here to help podcast. Uh, looking forward to checking out Von Hildebrand with personalism. Yeah, um, I think that this, it definitely harkens back to love and responsibility a lot. That was the first text that I read. Yeah. Um, and you had something, what did you send me on on the the later synopsis? Um, oh, yeah, so this is what you sent me later on in the text. Um, Wojtyla says the argumentation and substantiation of the ethical norms in material covered in love responsibility would not be complete and would not be sufficiently thorough um, if he's saying that the root of these issues is a vision of the person. This person would have to be examined separately. So, right. Yeah, so love ahead. and responsibility came first, 
And then he's like, well, we need to look at some even more fundamental things too. Cause he's talked about some of the content of like morality in love and responsibility, but he's like, well, now I need to go even more fundamental. Yeah. And this is certainly deep, deep fundamental. What are some other, um, well, we, we didn't, of this. we didn't say the second way that the, the act is oh, connected. The active person. Person. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. So we had persona and persona and act two, the imminence of the per, whole person in the act. The second one is actus personae, the act of the person, uh, the transcendence of the person by means of the act. Uh, the will is choosing to manifest its relation to good and truth. The act itself is a contribution on top of the integration of the person's capabilities, as in persona and act do. And it's what enables the person to act in a way that's connatural to him. That is, the person is transcendent and the act is also transcendent in having its own relation to good and truth. So that the, the first of all, we have what's already present in the person being integrated in the act, persona and act to. Then we have the act itself adding something, which is an, an added relation of the will to good and truth uh, being manifested so that the act actually is not just a like an emanation of the integrated person, but it actually, uh, even though the act is not, the act doesn't exist without the person, but um, the act itself is transcendent. It has its own relation to good and truth. And therefore um, the act is something that is commensurate with the dignity of man as a transcendent person. That seems to be what he's getting at. Yeah. I, I, I see that one in, in what he calls efficacy, which is when efficacy, as I understand it, um, is the experience the experience that I act freely, which is already, as we talked about freedom, uh, connects with the transcendence, the su supernatural reality or this or this non-material reality of man in his freedom. Uh, but it's also indispensable for the moral value. the The act adds something because it shows man becomes conscious of his efficacy. And conscious of his transcendence, and then yet more, he's conscious. He's conscious of the moral value of his act. So that, as he when he acts, it adds that dimension that his act becomes a participation in a transcendent moral value. That's what I. That's yeah. what I understand of it. Yeah. Um, let me just look through here. I'm just trying to see what else. What else we should. Uh... Yeah. Excellent touch on here um i took some copious notes on the uh on the synopsis in particular um so yeah he gets into the different bodily aspects of this that the way that the organism you know uh the psych the psychoemotive the somatic reactive all this stuff i don't know if we need to go into detail about that um uh you you mentioned feeling is not emotion uh, feeling is not emotion um, which is interesting. I oh, actually, I found the, the discussion of the psycho emotive, uh, pretty interesting. Um, so he talks about the way emotion works, that actualization of emotion involves an elicitation of a motus, um, the, the, the motion itself from the subjective psychical potency with the help of an objective factor that constitutes the movens, a quasi motive of that motus. And the movement motus itself isn't located in the body, which I thought, I don't know. I thought that was very interesting. So he, he talks about emotion always involves a motive, an objective factor, which um, that's actually been a topic that's interested me for a while because of my interest in music and the sort of relation between music and the emotions. I remember getting into uh a debate after class when I was a freshman at Christendom with my philosophy professor, Dr. Cuddeback. You've probably seen his stuff online. Um, uh, and I was disagreeing with his view of how music affects the emotions and passions. And my, 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 the point I remember making was like, well, an emotion always has kind of like a, 
uh, a rational component to it that music can't provide. So while music affects the physiology in some way, my, my argument was that uh, it doesn't provide emotion, strictly speaking, because anger or fear or, or something like that, they all, there's always an object. There's always like a rational object to it. Uh, there's a motivating, objective motivator that, like, that Wojtyla talks about here that, that music in itself can't provide in its substance. So that, I don't know, it just made me think of that, but I, I, I like that he talks about the objective factor. So that emotion is not just something of the purely of the body. Um, but, and yet even on top of emotions and, and affections, there's still feeling on top of that, which is sort of the full cognitive, um, taking into account of the emotion that's occurring. It seems like the the objective object, that's what provides the consciousness, the ability to have this uh, rational right. control of emotions. It's so what it. and it's what specifies emotion because we can have all sorts of chemical reactions in our bodies, but none of them are specified as emotion without an object. Hmm. Okay. And then coming to terms with the relationship between these emotions and the objects and rationally acknowledging them and analyzing them is how we integrate those and have reached this integration. In our so person. is that what feeling is basically? Well, I mean that the terminology that I introduced earlier, that was from a t an entirely different work. I don't even remember if he does that distinction, but he, this, the, the work that I was referring to was essentially going back into uh, relationships and just relation with your fellow man um, where you, you do have emotions um, and Hildebrand talks about effect effectivity and, and how you do have these emotions that arise in you and we can make them um, into only bare passions, but there's also a movement of your heart in things. Yeah. Uh, which Hildebrand's very big on the heart as a as a, a, a deeper he calls it the spiritual center of the person, and so you do have this re reaction, this affective reaction, um, which can be either uh, it can be sort of sanctioned in yourself so that it is cultivated and uh, understood and sort of becomes part of your affectivity, your your orientation, if you will towards a thing or a person or an object or whatever, or it can also be disavowed because it can be, it can also be harmful if, if you're having an, an effective response that's also negative and, you know, it's, it's incongruous with the objectivity of values, for example. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's how I understand. It, um, yeah, go ahead. It's really interesting just how, um, and this isn't even really like something that he spends a lot of time dwelling on in the, in the, in the bulk of what we've read so far, but um, I'm just fascinated by this like sort of middle place that affections and emotions have. So he says that affections can arise because of mental cognitions and judgments, uh, which indicates that they have a spiritual as well as a sensual character. They're related to values, but the, he says they're neither fundamentally appetit appetitive uh, nor fundamentally cognitive. Um, emotion is not in itself desire or striving, but it's significant for appetition. Um, and he says, I'll quote him here, values are contained in emotional facts as their objective correlate, uh, though they are not yet recognized as values in them. Um, and he goes on to say that emotivity is the, quote, concentrator of the interior life. It makes cognition of bodily reactivity more possible. So it so it allows us to be more uh, to to integrate the reactions of the body think of like the things that happen in us that we don't cause as acts. It allows us to integrate those in, co in a cognitive way. And it also makes spiritual values more powerful and effective in, uh, in the person, um, which is part of what education is all about. Um, but this made me think of something that Plato talks about. I forget where he talks about it, but he talks about like the three parts of man, like the, the head, 
the chest and the lower regions. And he talks about the chest as being the kind of the mediator between the two. And so this seems to be the role that emotions play that Voitiwa is talking about, that they, they are mediators between the spiritual and the lower, and they can elevate the lower and integrate them uh, into our intellection. And they can also um, make the, the higher spiritual aspects of us more effectively command the body. Excellent. Yeah. And um, I want to wrap up by just kind of going towards where the, the um, Voitiwa writes this text at Vatican II and after. Hmm. And he's he's basically it's a philosophical text. So it's really um, talking very philosophically and it's not going so much into the spiritual aspects yet. Uh, but I think that the exploration of the subjective, it really opens up the reality of, uh, I, I think of uh, St. Paul's phrase that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, that the mm -hmm. Holy Spirit dwells in us and sanctifies us so that God truly can integrate us into this human person, into this the, the Christian who's anointed, uh, so that we can give ourselves to God and give all of our being to God so that all of these different layers of our consciousness and our being and our person that he has created can be united with Christ. Um, I, I think I reflect on that when, um, when this, this work goes so deep into the, the consciousness, it's um, on the one hand, it's frightening as we consider our sins because our sins corrupt all these areas and everything. Um, but then it's also uh, glorious when the, when the saints really can, when God creates saints and he sanctifies what he has made, he, he indwells in the temple that he has created. Yeah. And if I can just say one more thing to, um, you know, we were talking before about the way that the subjective and the objective are integrated and sort of the cognitive and the intuitive aspects of consciousness are integrated. Um, it, it tells us something about the role of reason in, in contemplation as well. Um, um, because he says that understanding helps experience. Uh, he, he makes this distinction between, between experience and understanding, which I thought is really interesting because we're always, uh, today, the modern world elevates, uh, lived experience, not in the sense that Voitiwa means it. It elevates lived experience as the defin definition of truth. I can't tell you how many times I've, I've made a philosophical argument or, um, you know, even like a statistical case about something and heard somebody say, you're denying my lived experience. And it's like, no, I'm not. I'm just, your lived experience just isn't sufficient to answer all of these questions. It's not yeah. the fact that you have experienced, uh, you know, um, uh, a big, a, a bigoted, uh, comment or something like that doesn't tell us anything about the prevalence of this in society as a whole, for instance, even just like on a statistical level, or like the fact that you experience something a certain way doesn't mean that you're interpreting your experience correctly. So people talk about experience in itself as though it has value without having to form your intellect and be, and your, and govern your passions and everything so as to be able to interpret that experience in a mature way. And so when he distinguishes between experience and understanding, that's very helpful. He says that understanding helps experience to fulfill itself in its proper cognitive character. Um, he also says that understanding and cognitious cognition don't depart further and further from experience um, as might be some people might think the danger is when you're doing metaphysics, for example, but they actually result in new and deeper intuitions. Indeed, he says, perfect intuition is the end of the discursive function. So he's actually saying that the, the purpose of reason is to ultimately to perfect intuition so that all of this flows back into our lived experience, which now takes on a cognitive character by that it is fully integrated into experience. So, so that I think that like when we talk about the sort of knowledge that we will have in the beatific vision, or even the sort of intuitive contemplation where reason falls silent, uh, when we live as we live on earth, I think that this all relates to what he's saying about, 
uh, the fact that ultimately the goal is to have these integrated so that uh, this understanding exists not in a series of cognitions, but in a single act of the intellect or in the, in the case of human beings in a single act of, uh, of, of lived experience, a single um, integrated whole where the, the cognition and sensation and everything are fully integrated in one moment. And it's just a fully mature way of experience th of experiencing things intuitively, which I thought was very beautiful. Yeah. I, I as you say that, I, I think of just the conscious experience of God. Uh, we have, we can learn our catechism and we can learn our doctrine, but there's some moments in our Christian life, which is like, I think just experiencing the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, having, having the, the sort of this knowledge, this consciousness of his presence. Yeah. And, and that, uh, when we go into these layers of consciousness, then we come into this conscious awareness of the person of Christ, the presence of Christ, the presence of God, where we truly have this, this union with Christ. So, uh, all that to say, um, I, we're, we're all out of time. Uh, Thomas, any final words you wanted to, uh, share? Yeah, I don't know. You know, I, I just want to, like I said before, I, you know, reading the first 30 page synopsis was really hard. And then as I got through it, I I started seeing how this actually relates to my life, you know, um, in the later chapters. And so now at this point, I'm totally hooked and excited to read the actual the actual study, you know? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I'm looking forward to getting into further yeah, the actual text. I, I think that it'll probably be easier to understand, I imagine, once we get into the yeah. actual uh, text of it. But yeah, so stay tuned. Uh, once again, the critical edition... Uh, volume one uh, you can link is below to take a look at that um, yeah. we also uh, have a uh, prior shows Thomas and I did with uh, on John Paul II we also have Jagash Ignatik talking on John Paul II as well yeah, that was a good one so yeah so uh, this is uh, mean of Catholic we're all about uh, discussing different points of view different Catholic points of view uh, understanding them presenting them for what they are uh, so that's what we're doing with John Paul II and others. So stay tuned. So thanks a lot for watching. Let's offer up an Our Father, uh, especially praying for, as, as we draw closer to Lent, that our personhood may may have this transformation in Christ, uh, that ultimately the divine person of Christ would fill our persons so that we can also bring the gospel to others. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Jesus is King. Amen. Amen.